So good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome to AXA's 2016 uh, full year results. Welcome to those on the phone. Welcome to those on the webcast. And of course, welcome to those here in London. Uh, for the Q&A, we'll be happy to take questions uh, from those on the line or on the phone, uh, on the webcast. Just please follow the instructions that you've been given. Uh, we'd be happy to have your questions, but we will give preference to uh, questions from people here in the room. The presentation this afternoon will be made uh, by our group CEO, Thomas Burbal, and our group CFO, Gerald Alam. We're also uh, joined and, uh, and present and delighted to take part in the Q&A today uh, is Gail Olivier, our group CEO for our PNC operations, and Paul Evans, who is our group CEO of Life Savings Health and Asset Management. Uh, so they'll be happy to take your questions as well this afternoon. And it is my pleasure to hand over to Thomas. with you in London, even though it was not easy to get here due to the stormy weather. The results, or our results, on the contrary, are not so stormy. When we look at the key takeaways, the results have been very solid in a very challenging environment. We have managed to grow in all lines of business. We have delivered an earnings growth that was particularly um, well uh, in the second half of this year, which has also led to the fact that the Board of Directors yesterday uh, will go with a proposal to the AGM to increase the dividend, which is clearly supported by the earnings growth. We have also continued to push ourselves in more innovation as you remember, we have presented the plan last year to you based on two pillars, focus and transform. And in the transform piece of the plan, we have the very clear ambition to become global innovation leader in insurance. When we look at the earnings growth, I said the second half of the year has certainly helped us a lot to achieve an attractive earnings growth of 3% underlying earnings growth and 3% adjusted earnings growth. This is certainly much higher than we have reported at, at uh, half year, where these numbers were at zero and minus two. When we look at the underlying earnings per share, we can also see that they have increased by 4% and the adjusted earnings by share by 3%. This has enabled us to propose to the board, and the board has agreed to it, to propose it to the annual general meeting, an increase of the dividend from 1 euro 10 to 116, which represents a 5% increase um, of the dividend per share. All of this is a payout at 48%, which is well in the range that we have indicated between 45 and 55% of adjusted earnings. If I go now into the different businesses, would like to start with the life and savings business, certainly a business that is highly marked by the low interest rate environment. Despite the fact that we were reporting minus 2% APE at half year, the second half has been very strong and we have achieved an overall APE growth of 2% across the year. At the same time, we have managed to increase the NBV by 5% at a very high margin of 40%. Why is that the case? First of all, we have experienced a strong growth in Asia, plus 16% of APE. Secondly, we have continued to work on the optimization of our business mix. More focus on protection, more focus on health, and more focus on capital light business. The third piece is we have continued our in-force management, and I would like to highlight one particular action in Belgium, 
where we have launched a buyout of 1.5 billion with a record high take-up rate of 70%, where we are continuously working on reducing our exposure to the traditional general account. A second important market for us is the PNC market. Also in this market we have experienced a growth of 3.4% both in the retail business and in the commercial business and you can also see that the difference between mature and emerging markets has materialized again and that particularly in the, in the emerging markets we benefited from a growth of 7%. At the same time, the loss ratio has been reduced, even though the overall combined ratio has slightly increased. That has got two reasons. The one is we have reduced the prior year relative to last year. And secondly, we have clearly set a target of growing more in commercial lines. If you want to grow, you need to invest and the increase in the cost ratio is reflected in the investment in growth. We clearly, however, confirm our combined ratio target for all year between 94 and 95 through to 2020. A third business that is very important for us and that is often uh, hidden behind uh, the life and the PNC business is the health business. We are today one of the largest players in the health business, very strong in six markets, one of them being the UK. We have experienced uh, an attractive growth of 4.3% in these markets and have reached a revenue figure of 12 billion. All of this at a very attractive combined ratio of 94.9%. Clearly a market where we want to continue our growth path. If we look at the cost savings, we have started Ambition 2020 that we have presented to you in June last year, in, in the last year. We have clearly phrased a target of 2.1 billion by 2020 and obviously we have started our efforts already in 2016. We have reached 300 million of savings and confirm our ambition of 2.1 billion by 2020, focusing on all key levers from administrative expenses through to claims handling expenses and acquisition expenses because the cost savings have a high contribution to the underlying earnings growth per share. When we look at the achievements relative to the Ambition 2020, we can clearly state that we have completed a good first step in this and towards this ambition. Why is that the case? With 4% underlying earnings per share growth, we are well in the range of 3 to 7. And those 3 to 7 were very much linked to how are the capital markets performing, how is the environment in terms of volatility. If you think about last year, Brexit, Trump election, those were all elements that have cr contributed to a significant volatility. The second area is cash flows. We have reached 6.2 billion free cash flow. Again, if you project this onto a journey between 2016 and 2020, we are well in the range of 28 to 32 billion. On the adjusted return on equity, same story, 13.5% well in the range between 12 and 14 and on the solvency position 197 again well in the middle between our target range of 170 to 230. So overall very solid results based on a very solid balance sheet and the first step in Ambition 2020 is well concluded. When we now look how do we invest in the future and how do we transform our business. We have clearly said that we want to lead this way and really think how can we transform. In order to do this we need to create an ecosystem for this transformation. We have started and acted very much with the financial and business means on it. We have built AXA strategic ventures 
we have already invested in quite a few ventures and have launched an additional fund this year of 150 million. The idea is to spot new startups, new ideas, and have a merger between AXA and the startup working together and benefiting from each other in a way that startups have many ideas, we have large scale, and the two together make a good combination. This has been very successful. On AXA Next that we have created last year, we are moving into new business models. If you take uh, my words on the health business, we see that there is certainly a lot of dynamic in this market. Population health management, which is around the question, how can you manage the cost increase in chronic diseases better, is something that we really want to be in. We're <coughs> developing new business models in this area. And Kamet, this is an incubator for disrupting ourselves. There we have also launched three concrete ideas um, in order to really create new business models. On the other hand, we are also in the middle of society acting as a social, uh, as a social contribution to society. And there it's very clear we have got a very strong hand on where do we invest and where do we not invest. We have taken the decision last year to withdraw from investments in the tobacco industry, which was quite a uh, bold statement. And we have also engaged ourselves in emerging market and providing solutions for the emerging middle class through our investment in MicroInsure, one of the two leading micro-insurance company in this world. A third focus for us is clearly to push more gender diversity. We have been very active on it and have also received a certification for it. And just to give you an example how strong our commitment is, on the group senior executives, which is about 150 to 170 people, we are almost at 30% women in the new round of nomination. I wanted to show you a few concrete examples of what has happened in the last couple of months in terms of really transforming the business. One of them is in Asia around prevention. This is a lot of the question, how can we really get closer to the customer, get more customer contact? Here we have clearly launched a chatbot where we have a mix of human and robo advice and where we have many, many more contacts to the customers than we usually have in our business. I would dream of a proper insurance contract to have seven contacts per week. This is impossible and therefore we clearly want to increase the contact frequency and give value-added services for the customers, where you see also in the second example, which comes from Egypt, where we have launched a telemedicine service where our Egyptian customers really use it because at the moment there's hardly any private medical infrastructure and we can help. Or if you take another example on the other extreme in adjacent services from Germany where we have launched an application called WayGuard where you are being accompanied by AXA. So imagine uh, your daughter uh, goes to a party on a Friday evening and uh, you want to make sure that when he, she parks her car away from her apartment that she gets home safely, she can connect herself to AXA and walk with AXA back to her apartment. This has been very, very popular in Germany, about 30,000 users and every 13 days a contact. This is clearly focused in the direction, how do we transform, how do we create a different customer experience, how are we much closer in contact with our customers. Thank you very much. I would now like to hand over to Gerald to go into the details of our numbers. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. So going to the, uh, going to the earnings. So uh, uh, underlying earnings are plus 3% at uh, 5.7 uh, billion. I won't comment life savings, PNC and asset management because as you know and as usual we have a dedicated part for each of these business lines. As far as banking is concerned, minus 19 is due to the decrease in interest rates. And for holdings, as you will see in the uh, 
uh, uh, in the, the appendices, uh, uh, we benefited from lower rates and also from uh, some savings, expense savings. Adjusted earnings, uh, mostly a plus 3%, mostly explained by underlying earnings. Net realized gains 415, mostly on, uh, on equities and real estate. And uh, net impairment 395, mostly on equities uh, as well, so plus 3%. Uh, net income, so as usual, we have, uh, we have some uh, elements which don't benefit, like, uh, like uh, derivatives which don't benefit from the hedge accounting. That's the reason why we have a negative adjustment of minus 158. Then we have the fair value of some funds which are marked to market, plus 40. Then we have the discontinued operation, and I would like to, to uh, mention three operations. First, uh, like in the first, and we, 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 sh we discussed it and we shared it with you in the first half, is the disposal of the two buildings in the US for close to 1 billion, uh, in, in fact, 973 million euros. And uh, we had as well uh, uh, the disposal of the UK wealth management business and uh, uh, the uh, disposal of Bluefin, which is a, a, a broker in, in the UK. So now, we, as you know, we have, we have uh, our business in the, in the UK, which is concentrated on PNC on health. So as a whole, minus 454 from this, uh, 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 plus 387 on this exceptional and discontinued operation. Integration and restructuring cost is linked to our workforce planning uh, investment and uh, uh, the 454 concerned Belgium uh, for roughly 50% of it. And the rest is uh, Germany and France. So as a whole, net income plus 2% at 5.8 billion. Going into a bit more detail and moving to life and savings. So uh, uh, on the top line, uh, uh, we have a growth of AP of plus 2%. Mature market minus 1, uh, plus 14. You can notice that the plus 2% is a, a, a significant increase. At, uh, at the end of, um, at the end of, uh, of uh, June, we were at minus 2. We were at 0 uh, at the end of September. So uh, a, a nice improvement. We are at plus two now. Uh, new business value, plus 5% and uh, plus seven in, uh, in uh, mature markets, minus one in emerging markets, coming mostly from China. And as you can read in the middle, uh, uh, China in BV is uh, uh, margin is at uh, 17%. There again, you remember that uh, there was a bit of emotion at the beginning of the year because we had a negative a NBV margin on, on China, so we end up at 17%, which is much better. So we walk the talk. I told you at that time that after the new year, we will uh, write much more protection uh, uh, business in, in, in China. That's the case. So as a whole, new business margin moved up from 38 to 40%. Um, then uh, let's concentrate on this slide on the net flows. So we have plus 4.4 billion of net flows of which protection and health plus 5.1. GA savings, it's minus three, but indeed it's plus 3.6 in capital light and minus 6.6 .6 billion in capital heavy. And uh, unit linked is plus 1.3, but we have been, uh, uh, we had the effect of the GMXP buyout. So excluding this effect, we would have been at plus two. So a uh, 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 nice level of uh, net inflows uh, in, in life. Uh, let's go to the underlying earnings. So on a post-tax basis, as I mentioned to you, we are at plus two. Uh, let's go through the pre-tax basis, uh, uh, minus five in uh, protection and health, explained by higher net technical margin. But you remember maybe that uh, in 2015, we had negative one-off and we had uh, some, uh, uh, we, we, we had in, in 16 the non-repeat of the assumption change in France. It corresponded to a positive 300 billion, 300 million at the end of 15. So uh, that means that on the protection and health, we have a, 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 a nice improvement of the technical margin, excluding this 2015 one-off. In GA savings, we are at plus two, explained by lower expense, higher technical margin, but lower investment margin. I'll go back on this later on. Unit linked, minus two. 
uh, we have a higher result uh, from the US in VAG MXB, but we have lower fees and revenues in Italy due to the specific situation uh, in Italy. And as you know, with MPS, we, we had uh, mainly, uh, 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 we have a significant part which was in, uh, in unit link business, and we have a higher DAC amortization. So, to make a long story short, it's a, a good quality earnings on the life side because it's more technical margin and more DAC. Uh, amortization. Another way to look at it, it's, uh, it's this, uh, 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 these charts. Uh, uh, we start from uh, 2015 uh, restated. It's starting from 3.4 billion. Then we have the protection and health plus 124, GA savings plus 15 million, US VAG MXB plus 107. Then we have other unit linked minus 131, mostly coming from two countries which are uh, uh, which are the uh, impact of Italy and uh, Belgium as well, other, uh, and uh, Forex and other plus 110. And we have this exceptional uh, uh, one-off in France in 2015, which makes that in 2016 it's a decline of, uh, co a corresponding decline of 259. Uh, then we have tax 131 and higher positive tax one-offs 35 and you will find all of this in the MDNA. So we end up at 3.5 billion. Let's move to property and casualties. So plus 3% uh, revenues, personal lines plus 4, commercial lines plus 2. Here you have the, our traditional slide on the, the price effect and uh, you can see that we benefited from a price effect of 3.8% in personal lines uh, 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 and uh, it translated into 36 in revenue growth. Price effect have been positive almost everywhere except uh, in Italy uh, where we, 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 the market suffered from decline in prices and I remind you that the market was uh, uh, um, at uh, very high prices in Italy. Uh, commercial lines plus 1.5 and in the end revenue growth of plus 2.3. You can see on the market pricing trend more or less we are still expecting positive uh, uh, price effects uh, in the UK and Ireland, in Spain and more or less flat in France and Germany and uh, negative trend in, uh, in other countries. Uh, mature markets, uh, uh, let's go to the uh, uh, margins and revenues. So, uh, revenues I mentioned to you plus three, it's plus two in mature markets, plus seven in emerging markets, and uh, here we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we in, in fact, it's nine percent on an economic basis. Why? Because we have uh, in, uh, in Asia, notably, we have uh, some, uh, uh, some entities which are consolidated under the equity methods. That means that the top line growth doesn't flow through the seven. If we restate, uh, we would have been at plus nine and uh, uh, direct is at plus 7% uh, uh, top line. Current year combined ratio flat in mature market, in emerging market slightly up, mostly due to the acquisition expensive expenses, di direct uh, 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 decline from 99.3 to 98.7, and as a whole we have a current year combined ratio which is up 0.2 points. Um, another way to look at it, and that's uh, our traditional slide, starting with the current year combined ratio, which is uh, what I just explained, but you have a, 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 another uh, element, which is natural catastrophes, and uh, we were at 0.5 this year versus 0.7% uh, the year before in 15. Uh, uh, prior year developments drop from 1.4 to 1.2 as a whole. Uh, uh, our all year combined ratio moved up from 96.2 to 96.5. Investment income was more or less stable with two, 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 two elements, higher average in invest, in invested assets, but as planned and uh, as we discussed in a, in a previous meeting and uh, uh, when, when we presented the, the, the plan, uh, uh, the investment yield is dropping from 3.6 to 3.4 within the range that uh, we shared with you. Asset management now, uh, net flows uh, as a whole are, are quite uh, significant, 45 billion, uh, plus 56 at, uh, at Axe IM. Uh, significant part of it is uh, 34 billion is uh, with the uh, Asian JV. Uh, average AUM is down 3%, mostly explained by the uh, 
partly explained uh, uh, by the Friends Life, the, the, the merger between Friends Life and, uh, and Iviva made that uh, in the end uh, uh, we lost the asset management contract, excluding it, as you can see on the right hand side on the top, revenues would have been at plus 1% excluding the Friends Life contract uh, uh, versus minus 3 published. Average AUM, uh, uh, AB, it's uh, uh, minus 12, and minus 12, uh, uh, it's, uh, it didn't change since uh, the, the third quarter. Uh, the, the negative, uh, the drag on the negative net, net flows corresponding to the, to the loss of uh, two large contracts. Average AUM plus one, and revenues minus three. Let's move to underlying earnings. So underlying earnings are down 8%. Minus 1% explained again by the Friends Life contract. If not, we would have been positive. On AB, we have a strong uh, uh, negative tax one-off of 50 million euros. And excluding this one-off, we would have been at plus 6%. Balance sheet now, it's uh, with the uh, invested assets. So our invested assets amount to 583 uh, uh, billion. Uh, no big change in our asset allocation, no big change in the asset duration, above 8 for life and savings, 5.6 for PNC. And as you can see, and uh, as I already commented for the PNC business, uh, uh, our, uh, um, our yield uh, uh, decreased uh, from 3.6 to 3.3 uh, for life and from 3.6 to 3.4 percent for PNC business. Um, no, no big change, our govies and relative bonds uh, 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 still benefit from a rating which is in double A range as far as the corporate bonds are concerned, still in the single A range. This, uh, this, is, this relates to the investments that we made during 2016. We invested 82 billion in fixed income uh, at an average rate of 1.8%. Uh, you have the, uh, the uh, allocation on the left hand side, so we invested more in, uh, in corporate bonds than before. Uh, you can notice below investment grade credit, which is at uh, 12%, it corresponds to short term high yield. Uh, uh, we want two remarks, we, we don't intend to invest anymore in, uh, in short duration high yield, they will lapse naturally because they have a very short duration. Uh, because the, the, the return is too low. Uh, presently, we have a spread on this type of business of uh, 1.5, uh, below 1.5%, 1. 1. which is not enough. So we'll invest in other categories of assets. Uh, uh, we intend to invest this year under present condition, whereas last year we were investing at 1.8. Uh, uh, we should invest slightly above 2 uh, this uh, in, in 2017. Asset and set and liability management, so we, we benefit, we still benefit uh, from a margin, significant margin of 140 basis points between the invested assets and the guaranteed assets on the enforced business on the left, as well as on the new business on the right. And our uh, uh, investment margin has been resilient at 73 basis points, well, uh, in the high end of the guidance, which was 65 to 75 basis points for 17 and 16, for, uh, for 16 and 17. Next is the shareholders' equity. Shareholders' equity went up uh, uh, by 2.1 billion from 68.5 to 70.6, mostly explained by the net income. We had an increase in net underwrite gains because uh, we had a drop in the interest rates in, uh, on the euro. Uh, we had the dividend and we had the reimbursement of sub debt and we had also the change in pension benefit. Uh, uh, why? Because due to this uh, drop in, uh, in the interest rates, we had uh, a lower discount rate. Roughly the discount rate was lower by 60 bips, which means that we had, to in we had an increase, a correlative increase in the pension debt. That's, that's mostly it. Look at the adjusted ROA, which is at 13.5, as mentioned before by Thomas, well within the 12 to 14 range. Financial debt, uh, as a whole, uh, as last year, you can notice that uh, uh, we still have mostly sub-debts, 9.1 in sub-debt and uh, 8.1 in undated supporting debt. You can see that the interest cover is quite uh, 
uh, quite good. Uh, depth gearing is at 26, and uh, uh, in, um, we have been upgraded by SNP to AA minus in October 2016. More or less across the board, we are AA minus uh, in all the, the three agencies. Uh, solvency to ratio, uh, we, we are at 197%, so uh, uh, you have the roll forward, so operating return explains plus 19 points. We started at 205. I remind you that we were at 191 at the end of September. Uh, dividend, so plus 19 compared with the full year 2015, plus 19 on operating return, minus 10 on dividend. Uh, uh, that's the dividend that has been paid in May last year. Market impact minus 14 and uh, the other elements minus 5. So we end up at 197, which is six points above the level of November, of, uh, of last September. Last uh, slide is uh, on the cash flow. So we have a strong cash flow generation and a strong remittance. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, um, operational uh, free cash flows are at 6.2, so in line with last year, but uh, the uh, cash remitted to the group, to the holding, at 5.4, so higher than last year because we moved from a remittance ratio at 80, from 81 to 88 percent. And now I hand over to Thomas for the conclusion. Thank you very much, Gerald. If you look at the results that we have presented, there's two major conclusions. One is uh, they are in line with a long series of consistent delivery. If you look at the previous ambition and this ambition, we have always managed to deliver what we have promised and the new ambition has had a first year of a very good start. What are the key characteristics? We have managed to grow the top line by 3%. We have managed to grow the earnings by 4%. This has led to a decision to increase the dividend per share by 5%. All of this based on a very solid business model, very solid balance sheet with a return on equity of 13.5 and a solvency to ratio of 197. Thank you very much for your attention and we are now coming to all your various questions that you will certainly have. John, why don't you start? Um, it's John Hocking from Morgan Stanley. I've got three questions, please. Um, firstly, on m and I think you've been very clear that you're not interested in large-scale M&A. I just wonder if you could just reiterate for us what your M&A criteria are, um, sort of size and uh, the sort of metrics you would look at if you were doing a transaction. So first question. Um, second question, just to pick up what Gerald said about the um, investment allocations. You're putting less into um, short duration or high yield. Yet where are you reallocating to in terms of the, um, the reinvestment mix? Um, and then just finally, on the, um, on the interest cover, the interest cover's jumped up uh, dramatically and the leverage is still fairly similar and the earnings haven't moved a lot. I just wonder what's driving the jump in interest cover. Thank you. Thanks, John. So I'll take the first question and Gerald would uh, do number two and three. Um, there's certainly many questions at the moment uh, on M&A. Um, when we look at AXA's history, uh, AXA has grown by uh, bold on M&A. The aim was uh, to get to global scale. Today we are at global scale. So um, when we look forward in terms of M&A, it is not about um, acquiring small pieces and is not about large M&A. It is about where can we reinforce ourselves in the areas where we want to grow. What are these areas? Health, commercial line PNC and the preferred geography is Asia. We are actively looking out for targets. As you know, um, this market is very hot at the moment and it's never easy to get quickly to the right target, but we are very actively looking and when the time is right, we will take the right decision to uh, enlarge our footprint in these areas. Gerald for two and three. Yes, uh, uh, as far as the, uh, uh, John, as far as your, your, your second question is concerned, uh, yes, uh, we, we, I mentioned that uh, we, we didn't intend under present conditions and below a spread of 1.5% to invest in short duration yield. 
um, we are, we, 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 uh, as far as uh, below investment grade is concerned, we prefer these days uh, much more loans, uh, uh, leverage loans, because we benefit from covenants and uh, which uh, give much more protection. Uh, at the same time, we have higher spreads. You know, the way we manage, the way we manage our assets is really comparing the return on stake, comparing the return on economic capital. And that's why, from time to time, we, when you have the, the decline uh, uh, in the spreads, then uh, no more interest to, to, to waste capital, uh, uh, because it's, uh, it's the right word, to waste capital, uh, uh, to invest in such type of assets. That's, that's more or less the, the, the way we'll, uh, we, we do it. Uh, uh, on the interest cover, you remember that I said, and it was the same at the first, uh, during the first half, we said that uh, 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 in the holding side, we had an improvement in the, uh, uh, in the underlying earnings contribution coming from lower interest rates. Uh, 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 progressively, you know, with the decline of interest rate, we benefit from this lower interest rate, and that's, that's the case. Thank you. Let's move just the uh, roll forward, and then we go to the other side. Thank you very much. It's uh, Farouk Hani from Credit Suisse. Um, can you just comment, uh, please, uh, Gerald, on the sharp increase in US yields that we saw in Q4? How does that factor through um, into your earnings in the context of the plan that you gave um, Ambition 2020? And that's my first question. Second question is, um, general question, I mean, there's been a sharp increase in your market share in variable annuities in the US. So I, th I believe you're going up the tables in a market that's sharply down. Uh, what's going on there? What's the kind of outlook for that business uh, and the margins? Thank you. Good, we do. Gerald with the first question, and then Paul Evans will take the second one because... Okay. No, the higher rates in the US, it's a good news for us. It doesn't translate into the, uh, uh, so much into the, uh, uh, um, uh, into the RBC. We are roughly at 600. Uh, why? Because it's, it's inverted, you know, it's, it doesn't play, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, improve the solvency position like in, uh, in Solvency 2. But in reality, the economic situation is improving while interest rates are going up. Uh, uh, and you can see, uh, uh, I, I could go through, the, uh, through some appendices, and uh, in the appendix you have the, uh, uh, the contribution to, to earnings uh, of, the, of the U.S., and it's uh, um, on page, yes, on page B31. And on page B31, you can see that indeed, uh, uh, in the end, we have a contribution, which is uh, the interest rate, credit and spread. You can see it's the fifth line. And uh, you can notice that we are positive. We are at 34. A and again, that's a situation here. It's net of DAC, but that's a situation which in, s in itself is quite positive because uh, the higher the rates, the more we can, uh, we can uh, 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 amortize a DAC. And you will notice that uh, 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 as far as the, I can tell you that as far as the old book of business is concerned, we decrease quite substantially our DAC, roughly by 600 million. So that, that's mostly it. So it's a good news. And, uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, the present situation where relatively high stock markets plus higher rates is a good news for us. Can Thanks. I follow up quickly with you. So would you say that in the guidance that you gave um, in um, Ambition 2020 that the US deal is more important than anything else? Oh, no. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, it's very, uh, no, uh, the, 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 the US yield are important, but uh, what is uh, as much is part, important is also the, the, the yield curve in Europe. And the yield curve in Europe is very important, but at the same time, it increased, but not so much. We are coming, remember, just after the, the presentation on the 21st of June, uh, we had rates in, in Germany going down to minus 30 bips. Now we are at plus 30 bips, so it's far better. We benefit from this situation. It's at the end of the game. Remember that the base case, the base case that we showed uh, uh, in last June uh, was a slight increase from roughly zero, where we were before, to 100 basis points, uh, 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 if I'm right, by the end of, uh, uh, by the end of 19. So uh, uh, we are on this path. So what is important is from a macroeconomic perspective, I would say, from an interest rate perspective, we are back in a basis case, which is a great news. Second question, Paul. So, Farouk, on the um, 
variable annuity market. So yeah, you saw last year that the US market was down as distributors and providers prepared for Department of Labor uh, reductions around fiduciary duties. Um, and indeed, actually US's sales were down in the first half of the year. Around 40% of the US volumes of variable annuity. And the US had launched a product uh, which is called the um, Structured Capital Strategies, which is an investment effectively in an index where you uh, offer to uh, guarantee a reduction of 5, 10, 15, 20% in the value of the investment over time in exchange for a give on the upside. And we saw very strong sales of that proposition uh, throughout 2016, and in particular, it's part of our Q4 growth story, uh, when, of course, the market additionally then took into account the views of the incoming administration. Uh, the margin on that product is lower than retirement cornerstones. Retirement cornerstone is the traditional VA replacement product that we introduced after the financial crisis. Um, it's about half the margin that we get from retirement cornerstone. So VA doesn't equal VA. We move over to that side. Uh, Nick Holmes of the Sock A couple of questions. The first on expenses. Your cost reduction program, although the uh, the gross numbers are pretty good, doesn't seem to be hitting the bottom line. Uh, perhaps in 2016, quite as much as in previous years. I cite, for example, PNC expense ratio rose to 27% from 26. I wondered how confident are you that the 2. Point billion is actually going to hit the bottom line. And second question is with growth. Uh, Asia are uh, going very, very well. But um, I wondered what your thoughts are about the areas that you've highlighted in the past as growth areas, in particular healthcare and, of course, unit linked, neither of which is quite delivering, perhaps, as you had hoped, or certainly unit linked is not. Thank you. Thank you for your two questions. Uh, I suggest that Gerald is taking the first one on costs and Paul will take the second one on health and unit linked. Yes, uh, so you, uh, at the same, you, you said uh, our expense don't hit the, the bottom line, especially <coughs> in PNC. Uh, you are right, but it's due to the acquisition costs. Means that uh, as far as the admin cost, we are perfectly on track. And it's due to acquisition costs, especially on the commercial lines. And maybe there will be questions on this and, uh, and Gail could develop. Uh, uh, um, what I can tell you is that we are on track. We confirm the 2.1, so that's uh, no fear on that side. We will do our plan. Maybe, Gail, before Paul answers, uh, uh, go into that topic on acquisition costs yeah. on commercial line to clarify the <coughs> question fully. First, it's important to see that on the retail side, expenses are flat. So that goes in the right direction. On the commercial lines, expenses are increasing slightly. Admin expenses are flat. Acquisition expenses are increasing slightly. It's a combination mostly of two factors. One is uh, one of uh, change of methodology in some of our international segments, which has been brought back into the uh, overall commercial line segment. And the other dimension is specific investment that we are making to develop partnerships. And as you know, partnerships uh, develop uh, over a few years. So we are incurring the cost to start with. And we expect over the next year that we see the benefit falling into the, the earnings. So on uh, healthcare and unit linked, so if you go back to A22, which shows the, um, the mix of APE, so first on health, so we've shown 4% growth in revenues in healthcare. I can't see you, Nick, sorry, wherever you are. Uh, hi, Nick. 4% um, growth to uh, 12 billion in uh, healthcare, uh, which actually was very solid performance across the board, uh, and it was despite some uh, turn back in the Gulf in particular. Uh, in Unit Linked, you've got a combination of stories in Unit Linked. So, uh, we had a situation in Italy that uh, Gerald touched on where it became obviously very difficult to distribute what was a predominantly Unilinked product through the branch. We had the closure of the individual savings business in Belgium, which further reduced uh, UL. We had the uh, experience in the first half of 16 when stock market volatility had a particular impact in France, uh, but also, as I touched on earlier, the VA impact in the US. Nevertheless, I increasingly look at UL and Capital Light GA together because we are increasingly re-engineering 
um, our GA products to be capital light, <laughs> i.e. the NBV margin is such that the AFR is matching the step requirement after an MVM uh, or above. Um, so in particular there we saw strong growth in, uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, for, in particular, uh, in Italy, we were able to sell capital light uh, in the bank rather than UL. So you need to look increasingly at those two lines together. So I'm less concerned now that UL should grow year after year after year. I'm looking at the two together. And of course, capital light uh, grew last year by 23%. Nick, maybe just to add on the cost side, because uh, numbers are one thing. The other thing is what are the lead indicators for cost? And if you look at uh, where are the core restructuring programs happening, and Gerald uh, was mentioning uh, the restructuring cost numbers, uh, you have a very big restructuring program in Belgium, you have a significant one in France, you have a big one in Germany, and another big one in the US, and also particularly in the UK. So everywhere we are in the preparation, negotiation, and implementation of restructuring programs, our core business is in Europe. One key value of AXA which we would really like to keep is the social partnership with the social partners, which means you have to invest time in negotiations. Um, but that pays off because if you take the three countries that I have mentioned where you have very high <coughs> social partnerships, France, Belgium, Germany, we have concluded very positively to go into the implementation. So if you look at the lead figures of what will happen in terms of cost savings, uh, that is a very clear green light for the future. Ralph Hepkin from uh, KBW. I've got uh, two, two things. One is on the cash. Uh, you showed a net remitted number of 5.4 billion, I think. Uh, I'd like to discuss whether that number still includes any repayment of internal debt. And if it does, <laughs> it would be great if you could tell us how much and indeed whether your strategy is ongoing to pay down internal debt uh, domiciled in the AXA financial holding in the US. And the second question relates to PNC. Uh, we all noticed that you have combined the old PNC function and international insurance. You have repeated your target, but indeed extended it to now include the international or the, the, the core business units in the old inter international insurance segment. So my question is basically, what drives that optimism? Do you, are you hoping to generate diversification pricing benefits from the uh, combination of the two segments? or anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question one for Gerald, question two for Gael. Okay, Ralph, uh, so uh, your question about the, the 5.4 billion, did we reimburse that uh, coming from the US? Yes, uh, we roughly 1.2 billion. And uh, uh, it was higher than the previous year. You remember that I mentioned uh, guidance that was around 0.6 uh, uh, billion. Uh, uh, why? Because we had the disposal of the two buildings and uh, the cash of the two buildings has been upstreamed. And uh, um, your, your second part of your question is about what's next and what will you do in the future? Yes, we will go on. And the objective is to, to have a regular basis at a lower pace, of course. Uh, uh, but as a basic principle, uh, it's also to, to, to reimburse. Another point also, you remember that uh, in June, uh, I said that uh, I was comfortable with the 75 to 85 uh, uh, remittance ratio guidance because we had some potential also to reduce uh, uh, capital. I'm sure you remember this, to reduce capital and to optimize capital in Europe. So uh, 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 globally speaking, that means that's why we are comfortable and we remain comfortable within this range because uh, there will be plus and minus depending on the years, but we still have this capacity to optimize our, uh, our um, financial situations. Gael? So on the commercial end side, maybe just to re-emphasize what <coughs> we have done in 2016, you see the growth at 2.3% more or less on the commercial end side, and that includes the international segment. You see a loss ratio which is improving by 0 0.8, and you see an expense ratio which is increasing, not on the admin, but on the acquisition side. So that gives us comfort going forward 
that we can achieve our overall all-year combined ratio target for the commercial segment by 2020 to reach 94 to 95% range. Because despite being a soft market, we are able not only to grow our business through a mix of price, but also volume effect while improving our underlying profitability. Now, if you remember what we had disclosed back in 2016 and June, in our targeted segment strategy for commercial lines, we see good progress there as well. If I just illustrate with the initiative that uh, Amanda here is a sponsor of, which is the SME initiative, we are growing that segment at 3.6%, which is well in the range that we have also shared with you back in June last year. And the other element is in the interna international segment, you have two main pillars. One is the assistance partners part, and the other one is the corporate solutions part. On the partners part is exactly what I mentioned earlier. We are today incurring some investments to develop new partnerships, and we expect those partnerships to really develop in the coming years and to translate into earnings in a profitable manner by 2020, which is why we are reiterating our target of 94 to 95% combined ratio all year by 2020, including as well the international segment. It's Mark um, Cathcart from Jefferies. You mentioned a bit earlier about M&A, <coughs> but if we got into a situation, monstrum horrendum, where in Taser, Generali, Allianz, Zurich, things happen in Europe, you mentioned that you've got global critical mass, but your market shares could erode relative to large players quite significantly within Europe. We saw Allianz tweak their capital management strategy just one year into their business plan, my question is phrased as this. Does AXA have the essence of flexibility in their thinking um, to consider adapting their business plan if you start to get sizable moves going on within Europe? The question is always which sizable moves. I have uh, said earlier that we have two areas where we do contemplate M&A in the main geographies that we have. I prefer Asia, but again, if there is M&A opportunities in Europe on commercial lines PNC or on health, I'm always ready to look. But when you look at it at the moment, many of the opportunities that are presented are in traditional GA life. And that's certainly not something I'm interested in. We go this way and then to Andrew. Thanks. Uh, Peter Elliott from Kepler Chevrolet. Um, had a couple on solvency, please. Um, first of all, I noticed your sensitivity to interest rates seem to have uh, increased quite a lot. I was wondering if you could just say what's, what's happened there or the reason for that. Um, and secondly, um, in the second half of the year, we w you were looking at uh, 11 points of uh, operating uh, earnings on a sort of solvency to basis. I'm wondering if you can just sort of say how much of that you might consider one-off because obviously it's, uh, you know, I guess it's, uh, it's above your sort of guidance for ongoing um, someone's capital generation. Gerald? Uh, as far as the, 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 the sensitivity, uh, uh, I could say that we, we, we have to, you, you have to take into <coughs> consideration the fact that we are benefiting from the equivalence. The equivalence makes that when interest goes, uh, go up, uh, uh, we, uh, in all uh, uh, non-US companies, we benefit from this situation. That means that so long as we have an open duration gap, which is relatively limited, but say one year, we benefit, we benefit from higher interest rates. But in the US, it's the reverse. It's the reverse because we are using RBC. So that's why you, can, you could be surprised on page 40 that uh, we are at zero. Uh, uh, that means that we have uh, an interest rate uh, sensitivity which is relatively limited, plus three points. Uh, from an economic point of view, it would be higher. That's the message. Uh, <coughs> uh, next, uh, uh, the about the operating return. You know, it, it's difficult to draw. Uh, yes, we, we, we said that it would be between 15 and 20, and you are referring to this, between 15 and 20 bips of operating return per year. 
we are in the high end of this range. We could say it could vary from one, two points, but it's not substantial. What is important is to say that uh, at 197, we are well within our range and that's it. There are always some fluctuation. But I believe that uh, uh, wait uh, uh, until mid-year and you will have the SFCR report and we will have opportunity to, to discuss with you uh, on uh, more sensitivities and so on. But uh, 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 no, we... we uh, no, no specific sign about a, a change in the guidance. We said 15 to 20. We, we remain within this guidance. Sorry. Uh, hi, uh, Andy Hughes from uh, Macquarie. A uh, couple of questions. Could. First one, the reinvestment rate. Obviously, it's, it's gone down in the second half versus the, uh, sorry, f f versus the first half. Um, just quite curious about the leverage loan investment strategy that you're planning. Um, how much yield are you getting on the leverage loans, and what's the risks in the in the leverage loan portfolio? C can that be a large part of the assets of AXA Group, or is it always going to be a very small part of uh, of the business? And uh, a second question was about um, the commercial lines expansion. So I guess I heard from Zurich and maybe also AIG that they were pulling away from long-tailed lines in commercial because of the inflation risk. And um, I'm just wondering how, how you feel about that at the moment. Um, I can see it's probably a bit hard to, to beat you up over the reinvestment rate and the inflation rate at the same time, but uh, it seems I'm doing it. Uh, so uh, on the PNC side, if inflation picks up, I mean, obviously you've got quite a long duration on the PNC assets. Um, how, how well provisioned are you against that? Thank you. Gerald, do you want to take the two questions on investment and then, Gail, maybe you comment uh, on the uh, commercial lands business and yeah. the long-term nature so of it? Uh, about the, the leverage loan, I, 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 it was an example. So uh, last year, as I said, we invested 12% roughly in below investment grade. Uh, uh, but we are speaking from, and last year we had 82 billion to invest, which was quite large. This year I'm expecting to invest, to have between 40, 50 billion, 45 to 50 billion to invest. So I'm speaking for a few billions. I'm not speaking from... For, uh, from huge amounts. About the spreads, your question was what do you expect in terms of spreads? It's something like uh, a spread of 250 bips, something like this. Because again, uh, uh, the, the point is that, I, I, uh, you know, the reference for us is really how much capital, that, that's, the, that's the, the, the answer I gave before, uh, that's the amount of capital that we want to dedicate to it. So I'm not at all ready. You can see that all the line of business, all the line of business has a quite high return because that means that in terms of return on investment, return on equity, we have high levels. I don't want to invest and to dedicate capital in order to have, say, less than 10% return. So that's, that's why we, we, we are quite keen and mobile, flexible in terms of investment. Last point and to, 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 to answer fully your questions, at no time we would like to change uh, and to, on average, our portfolio should be single A plus. I don't want at all uh, to change the average rating of our portfolio because indeed, in the end, uh, it would mean more capital for a, a, a marginal return. We are today in a situation where spreads are quite low and uh, uh, look, there is such a demand for US because most of the short-term high yield is US short-term high yield, as you know. And there is such a demand for high yield products that spreads are at a level which are no more reasonable. That's the message I wanted to convey. Nothing, uh, nothing more. And it won't change. It won't change fundamentally the way we invest. But the majority mm -hmm. of our investment will still be in investment grade, say uh, 90%. Oh, sorry, the reason I was asking was that a lot of the yield comes from a small part of the assets. Yeah, so a lot of the yield could come from small part of the assets, but to develop more, uh, uh, you know, for example, a significant part of our, of our uh, uh, a significant part of our new money is invested in corporate real estate loans, for example, uh, 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 and corporate loans are investment grade loans, and uh, but they, they are illiquid, which gives a bit more return. So there is no magic in it, but. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, my team, my investment teams are working hard in order to find buckets of assets with good return, with, uh, uh, which are mostly investment grade, 
but with a high return on, uh, on, uh, on capital, even if we accept to be less liquid. Commercial line. On the commercial lines, I would say, on the perspective, I would say probably three things. The first one <coughs> is, compared to the competitors that you have mentioned, we have been historically less exposed to commercial lines. So commercial lines today is roughly 40% of our revenues, and we believe that there is a, a room to go for mm -hmm. us to grow our business in commercial lines, again, in a profitable manner. The second thing is the way we are intending to do it is in a very segmented manner, and we believe that today we have still opportunities to grow in segments in commercial lines. SME was an example, mid-market is another one, international offers where today we have a global presence is another example of areas where we believe we can grow business profitably in commercial lines. And the third aspect is if you project yourself five, ten years from now, we see some new risk emerging, cyber is one, but also probably the motor insurance where we will see more and more exposure towards commercial lines compared to what we see today being a retail individual insurance and we want to be in that market because we believe that this market is going to grow and we believe that we have the expertise to grow that business profitably. So that's why in our strategy long term, Commercial lines is an important dimension where we want to continue to grow market share, reach to the uh, normal market share that we should have or even beyond, and take the new risk opportunity that we see as opportunities for business. We go to the very back and then move over to Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, one question is for you, Mr. Bobel. Is the, um, so 3 to 7% was the EPS growth target over, over the period. 4%, I guess, is the number today. Um, does the 4% correspond to your judgment what you can maintain at the current level of interest rates? Or is there still an element of back-end loading with a, with a cost to come? So that would be my first question. Then, Ms. Arlan, the, um, on the cash flow from the US, 1.2 billion is a lovely number, but if I just deduct the gain from the buildings, it's only 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 billion, however you round it. Is there a stress there? linked to the proposal to increase the reserve capital for, for the US. How, how, how does that look? Um, and that's my only questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll do question one, and uh, Gerald will do question two. Um, you're absolutely right. We have uh, stated a very clear differentiation during our June 21st meeting between what is in our hands and what is not in our hands. What is in our hands are clearly the 8% underlying earnings per share growth uh, from growth, from margin improvement, from cost reduction, from better capital management. This we have to mirror against uh, the, uh, the, the, the capital markets, which is not in our hands. Um, we have planned uh, at the time for a very negative scenario where the one thing we hoped would not happen a couple of days after our investor day presentation Brexit um, was even considered. So the, the uh, yes, first of all, the 4% or whatever it will be is first of all dependent on how are the markets performing. We, uh, as said earlier, have seen good equity markets. We have seen a rise in interest rate in Europe, um, uh, sorry, in the US. We uh, have not seen yet a rise in interest rate in Europe. Um, we believe this will come over time, but it's a more longer term issue. And secondly, uh, you are absolutely right. When you look at um, the development between 2016 and 2020, I would not assume a linear movement because um, there are things that you have to invest in and have to get going before they materialize. I mentioned earlier uh, the cost. Um, if you want to reduce your staff uh, in European entities, um, you have to first understand where you can do it, how you can do it. You have to agree with the social partners. That takes time, but uh, I've indicated earlier that certainly in three countries, we have uh, reached a major agreement to go forward and materialize this. So yes, uh, this should not be uh, a straight line. Second question to Gerard. Yes, the, the, your, your question about the US cash flows, uh, indeed for technical reasons, you know that first, even if it's a repayment of debt, uh, uh, it translates into a repayment of debt through the holding company and then you have the, uh, the operating company and the operating company pays a dividend to the local holding company. 
And uh, for technical reasons, you should get uh, 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 an agreement from the, from the local supervisor. And we got an agreement extremely late, uh, which makes that for technical reasons, we kept some cash and it will flow in 2017. So don't have any fear. We have, uh, 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 except, the, uh, except the, the, the two buildings, there is real cash flow. Andrew, your hand must be falling off now. I'm sorry you had to wait so long. It's Andrew Crean, you're autonomous. Um, I want to take you up on that restructuring issue because um, your restructuring provisions have gone up by nearly three times to 450 million. They represent 8% of your underlying earnings. You're restructuring the organic business here. You're n it's not that you're acquiring new operations. Uh, should those restructuring provisions not be taken within the underlying earnings, in which case um, I think your underlying earnings would have been down 2%, not up 3% because they are costs which you are incurring to improve your business to grow the underlying earnings. And I suppose the, um, that's a sort of presentational question. Behind that lies what is the outlook for the 454 million of restructuring provisions? Thank you, Andrew. Gerald. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's, uh, no, we, we cannot, uh, cannot analyze it this way. Let's take uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the underlying earnings from uh, the... Uh, uh, restructuring cost coming from the uh, 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 coming from Belgium. It's more than 160 million. Where does it co what does it correspond to? It corresponds to a, 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 a disposal of a business. We stopped the business indeed. So uh, 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 it's not at all it's not at all underlying cost because it's a line of business that has been stopped. We decided clearly to uh, discontinue. Uh, uh, our uh, individual savings business. So these are costs associated to it. So it's uh, just like, uh, uh, imagine that you would dispose a business, there is no case for putting this cost or this loss uh, in underlying earnings. Uh, for the two other countries which are concerned, Germany plus, uh, uh, Germany plus, uh, plus France, it's really restructuring. It's restructuring because we have to uh, uh, we, we, we have to, uh, uh, we have pre-retirements in these countries and uh, these pre-retirements correspond also to uh, initiatives that are taken in, to, in, in order to change the business to be more effective, to be more profitable. So that's, that's more or less the case. So really, uh, uh, and it's not something that uh, uh, you could expect to have uh, uh, on a recurrent basis. So don't expect to have restructuring costs at such a level. Uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, future years. So you always have some restructuring cost, but this year it was at an exceptional high level, but for justified reasons. Blair? Thanks, Thanks very much. It's, um, it's Blair Stewart from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Uh, three questions, please. Um, we've talked about the plan a lot and the interest rate uh, movements. Um, I think within your plan, there's a 0% equity uh, assumption. We've had better than that, and we may well get better than that in the coming year. What, what can give us some form of sensitivity to, to what happens if you get some positive uh, growth in equity markets, say 5 or 10%? What does that do to the earnings of the company? Secondly, on, on Asia, um, you know, you've struck a fairly optimistic tone about Asia, but the... I noticed the payback period has gone from three to eight years. Is that a function of uh, macro conditions or is it something else? Because eight years is quite high by Asian standards. Um, and thirdly, I just wonder if you can give some commentary on the US. You've given uh, good guidance in the past about what might happen to DOL or what, ha what might happen to VA volumes uh, around the DOL, which is fairly accurate. Given that DOL is likely to get watered down um, given the possibility or prospect of lower tax rates, et cetera, in the U.S., I wonder if you can just refresh some of that guidance to what might happen in the U.S. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Blair. So let's take first question, Gerald, and question two and three for Paul. Okay. Uh, um, let's just, uh, uh, for sake of clarity, I propose you to go to page B21 because I believe it will answer your question. Uh, here, that's uh, the usual analysis, what we call the margin analysis of our unit link business. And here, you have uh, 163 billion of uh, unit linked average reserve. It's not exclusively uh, 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 equity. Let's say that roughly you have two-thirds in equity. 
So it gives you a good view. You have 2.6 billion coming from, un, uh, from, uh, from equity. So let's say that uh, a rise of 10% of the equity market more or less could represent something like 200 million pre-tax and pre-DAC. That gives you a, a good idea. I believe based on this page, you have a good, uh, a good view and, and good sensitivity of what it could, it could mean. Yes, for sure, it would be, it would be, a, good, uh, it would be a good news for us. That's what I said, uh, both in Europe, both in the US. Uh, we have two large countries where we have unit link business, as you know. It's uh, the US, it's France, and also other countries, but uh, not to the same extent. It would be an excellent good, uh, uh, good news. Asset management as well. Isn't it? Yes, asset management as well. You are absolutely right. And you can make all your mass uh, uh, on asset management as well. You have all the appendices uh, here. You are right. Paul, on payback in Asia and uh, US regulation. Back in Asia, I'll speak under Gerard's control. I believe what you're seeing there is the mix of country toward China. Gerard, are you going to yes. say yes to that? Yes. Uh, 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 it's uh, um, it's on, which, on, on uh, which page? 72. 72. Yes. And uh, uh, so what you are referring to is the fact that we are moving from three to eight years. And you are absolutely right. Uh, it's coming from the fact that... Uh, uh, um, uh, in uh, in uh, in China, we have uh, less. Uh, uh, we had a very high profitability in countries like uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and mm. uh, the fact that we we are growing strongly in a country like China with a marginal NBV, but the RR it's <coughs> not it's linked, uh, uh, makes that we are uh, uh, increasing the uh, the payback. That's that's uh, that's exactly this reason. Okay, good guess. Um, I mean, clearly the, th the Thailand mix, we saw two factors in Thailand. We saw our banking partner uh, have issues with performing loans, and we also, of course, saw the death of the king. So we saw uh, <laughs> downturn in profits uh, in volumes in a high-margin country and switched into China, where, which saw great growth. Um, the US, uh, it's difficult to give a projection in the US because there are now quite a number of moving parts. Um, so, yes, the new administration... Uh, issued an instruction that the DOL should reconsider their plans, but it's reconsidered their plans. We don't yet know whether that will mean they reconsider them and continue as planned. Certainly many distributors in the US are progressing as if the April uh, implementation date will continue. Uh, we expect it to change, but we don't expect it to be zero. We don't expect no reform of fiduciary duty, but we do expect it to be more favourable. Then you have the administration's plans for taxes, which are, of course, uh, unclear, but an expectation of uh, lower uh, corporation tax rates, which is positive for us, um, uh, expectation on dividend tax, which is negative, uh, and the key question is where will the administration go on estate taxes? So actually, I, don't, I struggle to give you as an accurate a range as we had for DOL, but I would say that the US market will nevertheless remain challenging for us during 2017. Sure. Corporate tax rate in the US? Uh, uh, corporate tax rate, it's 40% today. All, all together, we are at 40%. Yeah, uh, uh, but uh, pay attention because, and it's difficult to, s to, to make some speculation about this. For sure, it would be a great news. But uh, uh, take in mind that, uh, that we benefit also from the DRD reduction. So mm. on the face value, uh, uh, you could, uh, we could imagine an announcement of a significant decrease of the uh, tax rate to 15 or 20 percent, but if the the, the dividend uh, the, the DRD uh, uh, go down, it will offset. I believe that the net should be positive. I fully agree with what uh, uh, I confirm what uh, what Paul said. Uh, uh, pay also attention that uh, on the first year we could have a, 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 a slight depreciation on the DTA mm -hmm. on deferred tax asset. Okay, but it would be a one-off anyway. But on a recurrent basis, should be positive. How far? Difficult to say because we, we should know exactly what uh, uh, the devil is in the details. The face amount will decrease, but there could be some offsetting amounts which would be negative. So net should be positive. Going to the back again. So considering uh, France to be also the, the next political place, could you give a, a, a feel for how the various scenarios could play out for the group? Um, 
certainly here in London, there's always a discussion, a fear that you know um, France could exit the euro. I mean, maybe there's a hope. I don't know. Um. So this is certainly uh, a topic, and uh, when you take the, if you take the bond markets as a uh, temperature uh, feeling for how uh, certain or uncertain uh, something like this is. Uh, you have seen in the past couple of days that spreads between the OAT and the German Bund uh, have been widening. Um, this could be a, a sign of concern. If you go f back further in the history, you see that those 80 plus minus basis points uh, are actually not that high because um, we have seen times during the uh, European financial crisis where the spreads have been much higher. Uh, it is true today that uh, you can have uh, very different uh, scenarios uh, on the political front uh, in France. Uh, you know them as well as I do. Um, the question uh, arises, what is the chance of a Frexit? Um, the general sentiment in France, and my personal opinion is that uh, this chance today uh, is fairly low. Because after Brexit, um, it was a clear wake-up call for continental Europe. And what you see today is a much um, heavier cooperation and effort between the German and Franco couple. Because at the end of the day, if you want to give a new narrative to Europe, it is those two countries who need to carry the narrative. Both countries will have election this year, and uh, there is a strong hope and desire that uh, two candidates uh, and two uh, voted people emerge that will carry this, uh, this couple forward. So my personal opinion, yes, there is a chance, the chance is, to my mind, very low. And if you look at uh, the, the markets and the spreads that will show you that relative to the past, however, we need to prepare ourselves for it. Um, but we mustn't only focus ourselves on Europe, because apart from Frexit and Brexit, um, there is uh, many, many uncertainties in the US. There is China, uh, there is Thailand, there is Malaysia. Um, we are living in a world of uncertainty and risk and uh, fortunately our business is to manage uncertainty and risk. And if you look over the last uh, 30 years, we have always coped with this in a very proactive approach, identifying it early and acting on it. And I'm very sure that in a case of Frexit, which I really hope will not happen, we will be doing the same. John? Can I ask, you, you're clearly all very confident in the balance sheet and the, the earnings are pretty stable, the cash flow is looking good. Uh, what does it take for the dividend to move up through the payout ratio range? So, I mean, we have clearly uh, stated uh, today that the dividend will increase because underlying earnings have increased. And for me, this is an absolute uh, key paradigm. We want to keep the stability of the balance sheet. Uh, that is our asset, our backbone, and we don't want to jeopardize this balance sheet by uh, applying a dividend policy that does not follow the earnings. Ralph? Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, you need a microphone. So I didn't want to. You can finish your writing. I'm sorry, I didn't. No, no, it's, um, it's all clear. <laughs> uh, Actually, this was exactly the same question. I was just looking at... So I've at already answered it. Yeah, uh, I've already written the answer down here. No, I, I'm basically, perhaps just a, a slightly different framework. If you just look at the US, I mean, the US is clearly in bullet points. You have a 600% RBC ratio. The operations there are clearly self-funded. Um, sometimes you sell a building. There is internal debt still at AXA Financial, which you can upstream. The dividend which you paid is 1.5 times covered. This compares to an annual run rate in the past of 1.3 times. So, uh, slightly flippantly, what are you doing with all this cash? I, I understand, of course, the requirement and necessity to keep the balance sheet strong. But this is exactly also my sentiment. Would you not be able to, even now, allow the payout ratio to increase to perhaps the upper end or the upper half of the payout ratio range. 
So perhaps if you share some additional thoughts reflecting the enhanced cash generation capacity which AXA has achieved over the last two years. Look, f first of all, we don't have so many buildings anymore that uh, are left in the US. <laughs> Se secondly, uh, you are absolutely right. We have been successful in our cash generation and we want to continue to be successful. I've also given you a very clear hint uh, when questions came on the M&A strategy that we are dedicated to reinvest that cash in the activities that we like to increase. And when I'm talking about health and commercial lines, I'm not only talking about core insurance health and commercial lines. I mentioned earlier AXA Next. There are businesses developing beyond insurance that are related to insurance. I mentioned population health management. You could go as well uh, in the commercial line area and see that the risk consulting and risk identification piece, certainly if you take one booming area, cyber risk is uh, a business that we should be looking at. So we are all personally very committed and dedicated to invest this cash where it's required, where it's building our business and where it's generating further earnings capacity that we can then distribute. But again, we need to take one step after the other. Uh, hi there. I want to follow up on commercial lines because um, history is littered with companies that have gone into you know, new areas um, and have found that you know, profitability, especially in commercial lines, is challenged. And we're, we're facing a situation now where everybody's telling us, you know, whether it's international programs or you know, long tail, even sort of mid tail business, I mean, the pricing is down. So how can we be confident, how can you be confident that you're just not going to fall into that trap? No, certainly I just wanted to say, uh, just a remark that came spontaneous, being new in a business um, and having half of your PNC business in commercial, I wouldn't consider new, but Gael, you go ahead. I, I understand your question and I think it's, uh, it's important that I clarify. Commercial lines is not only the large risk. And very often, what you have in mind when you see commercial lines are really the large risk. So that's why I insisted so much mm. in my two answers before on the SME segment. It's an illustration of small companies, and we take SMEs, let's say, less than 50 people employed. And in that segment, those, in those companies, one, they are growing the economy. 80% of the growth of an economy in a society is coming from that segment. Two, they need proper protection. Three, they are not properly addressed today. And when I look precisely at what we are doing and the growth we are able to generate, again, the growth in our commercial line segment is 2.3 in average in 2016. On the SME segment, it's 3.6. So we have a segment there which is growing much faster. Now, to illustrate that, we have a perfect example here with the UK and what Amanda is doing in the UK. UK, mature country, you could say, uh, low inflation, low economic development, are you able to grow in that market in a profitable manner? And what we are able to demonstrate in the UK on the PNC side in commercial lines is that we are able to grow at 9% on the PNC side in the UK in a profitable manner. And we have other examples like that in other countries. We have also <coughs> other countries where we have already a very sizable commercial lines book. Take France, for instance, or Switzerland. So obviously, when we already have a sizable book, uh, the strategy to grow will be different. But when we have opportunities that we see in some markets and we attack them in a very segmented manner and we see the first success building up, then yes, we want to be confident that we can continue on that successful way and continue to deliver our growth, again, in a profitable manner. And those are not large risks. So it is not the long-term liabilities that you can associate with nuclear plant or uh, very large risk. Those are the business that we encounter every day when we walk in the street, when we uh, uh, do our own uh, individual needs. You go to the barber, you go to the coffee shop. Uh, those people, they need insurance as well. And that's what we are targeting. And the, I think the big opportunity that we have in our hands, being both a retail player and a commercial lines player, is that we are able to, de to leverage uh, the new technology today the new tools to address that segment in a much more convenient, lean, 
uh, user-friendly way, and that's what we are doing in the UK. I don't know, Amanda, if you want to add uh, yes. a few things. The power of a living example can never be beaten. So, Amanda, why don't you join me and tell exactly what you've done? So, yes, I, th I think the, the opportunities are not just in the traditional sense. So what we've done here is look at the various different segments, as Gail outlined, in the micro SME. We've looked at a different route to market. So we've looked at a more direct route to market, so taking what we know about the direct business, a digital approach, um, you know, a much more efficient with that, without any acquisition costs or with lower acquisition costs. And we've grown that business. We've started that from scratch. It's a pure digital play. It also allows us to do more value prevention and more, more rounded service. So I would completely echo what Gail has said and what I see from my sponsorship of SME worldwide is the opportunity for us to grow in SME is there in virtually every entity and the that you do not get then the huge exposure to big the, the big scary stuff which I think you you do all associate with commercial it's really more retail like than it is commercial lines perfect Amanda and and just to add to this because we looked at the UK now if, if you look into Europe where is our strength? Our strength is not in underwriting the scary stuff, if I might uh, may quote uh, Amanda. Our strength is in presence of, of agency sales force. If you look, what is the challenge of these agency sales force? They are today very much exposed to the motor business. We all know that you cannot make a living anymore in 10 or 20 years only for motor business. We are actively transforming these agency sales forces towards more advice-heavy business. Commercial business, the butcher, the barber, those are the ones uh, that are close to the agents. And if I give you one example of AXA France, where uh, Gael used to work, today we have significantly reduced the business mix of the agency sales force to 30% in motor only, and the commercial line space has taken this vacancy, so that is where our strength is. We don't want to go in broad international large risk. Our home turf is retail like SME. Nicolò Dalla Palma from Exam BNP Paribas. So my, my question is on innovation, and there were some examples on slide 14, which I thought were interesting. And the, so each of these examples clearly makes, makes sense, is probably profitable on its own, but it's small in the group, in the group context. So my question is, uh, how do you manage the complexity of innovation? Because it, it's, um, uh, it's a bit like a, rest, a good restaurant moving with, from a menu with, with a few plates, which are, which are a few dishes which are really good, to a, a very 40-page menu you know, uh, where, where you struggle to choose. My question is, are you looking at each of these initiatives as a call option on one, one or two or three or five of them will be great? Or are we just going to have to be used to a much more complex environment where you will be running thousands of initiatives that all together are profitable? No, so you're absolutely right. We don't want to create the menu with 40 pages. However, to get to a decent menu, you probably need to launch 40 things to see what are the three or four that are very uh, interesting and, and carry future value. On the slide here, I've only given you the latest ones. I have not mentioned the ones that are already in production where we are in the market. It is very clear for us that we don't want to have 40,000 uh, innovative ideas and innovative approaches. We want, however, to enable our people to innovate. And uh, one thing that has struck me when I was traveling to all the different uh, AXA countries in the first place and doing it again now is the innovative and entrepreneurial uh, activity and energy that, uh, that AXA has. And uh, that is in every country, be it in the UK, be it in Egypt, uh, be it in Asia. What we are going to do is to have a look which of these have the highest potential. And if you look, for example, at the telemedicine, um, at the telemedicine uh, idea, that has clearly been copied. We have started telemedicine approaches in the UK, in France, and have used the same logic and the same approach for the Egyptian market, obviously you have to adapt. Um, if you have no doctor and no hospitals, um, it is a very different uh, situation where you have an overpopulation of doctors uh, and a social security system on the side. So you take the same ideas and adapt it country by country. And uh, that's how we are going to do it. 
first create a lot and you also have seen in the slide beforehand that we have uh, very different approaches. Uh, we have one approach where we invest into innovations, we have another one where we destroy ourselves with Comet, disruptive approaches, and we have an, a third pillar which is building innovations out of ourselves. All those three it's important to generate the menu, but at some point the boss has to decide what are the dishes that are coming on the menu. And we are constantly in that phase, whenever a new idea for a dish is coming, we are looking, is it better than the dish that is, that is on the menu, or should we keep the old menu? So, it is clear, not a huge complexity, a slim menu, but also leveraging the size and the logic of AXA, which is, we can copy and paste from one country to another and you have certainly countries that are well ahead of the curve. If you take the UK market, very competitive, very innovative, much more advanced than many other countries. I think there was first in the, in the very back and then... So you, you reiterated the 94-95% combined ratio guidance but now it includes um, the international business which has always been higher, so around 98. So where does the extra positive come from to offset the, I, I don't make a lot of sense, but anyway, it sounds as if you improve your target is what I'm trying to say, and I'm just wondering where it comes from. Gael. So I will uh, probably repeat what I said earlier. Yes, it's, it, it is actually an improvement of the target. What gives us comfort there is two things. One, how we start to see the development of our plan going with a growth which is building up uh, both from volume aspect, price effect, despite a soft cycle, and with a loss ratio which is improving. So we see that as a good sign that we are able to grow despite the soft cycle and in a profitable manner. And the second aspect is what we call interna international segment, is basically two pillars, the AXA assistance partners part and the AXA corporate solutions part. And if you look at the partners part, that's precisely where we have started to invest, building new partnerships. That's why our acquisition expenses are increasing. And we expect those investments in partnerships to translate into earnings over the plan, which is why we are reiterating our target, but widening the scope in a wider uh, book of business, including yeah. international insurance. Hi, uh, Andy Hughes Macquarie. Um, just a, a kind of strategic question, I guess. Um, I think I think you sort of got me thinking about this with a comment about motor insurance and agents in 10, 20 years' time. I mean, uh, I could say the same thing about general account business with a reinvestment rate of 1.8%. You know, there won't be much of a future for agents selling general account business if we're earning 1 or 2% on our assets. Um, so I'm wondering, wh where do you see AXA in, in 10 years' time in the continuation of current trends? I mean, clearly they can expand into you know, direct markets as you described, providing that's not what everyone else does. Um, I guess the future is unit linked, but you've pointed out there might be volatility this year from the various <coughs> elections coming through. Um, where do you see AXA in 10 years time? Thank you. So Gael and Paul have spent a lot of time and energy to answer exactly those two questions and uh, I would like to give them the floor to answer. Gael, why don't you start, start and then Paul. So where do we see the market in PNC 10 years from now? First, we see retail continuing to develop, but not in the same manner as what is I it is implemented today. We see an opportunity to develop multiple interactions for the customers, and we see the underlying assets, let's say the motor for instance, the car, developing strongly in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles or the car sharing, and that should drive us to do our business in a different manner. We have started to do that. In the next five, five, ten years, we will not see a massive change in, on the financials. We will continue to see a claims development. We will continue to see price increase. But five, ten years from now, depending on the geographies, we expect to see disruption in the market with potentially a strong decrease of severity and claims. And that's where we need to adapt now our business or to take the necessary measures today to adapt our business and be able to transform it so that we are ready for the disruption to come in the 10 years from now. On the commercial line side, we see both an opportunity for us to catch up versus a market share that we, are, we do not have today compared to our existing size. We see an opportunity to grow 
as I have mentioned earlier, on specific segments which are underserved today, and SME is a very good example of this. And we see opportunities in new risk. Thomas mentioned cyber, that's one example. We see opportunities in autonomous vehicles. There will be more risk coming in societies at large, and commercial insurance will be able to address those risks. And that's why we believe commercial business, commercial PNC business, is an area where we want to invest, develop expertise, and grow. I don't mention further the risk consulting angle, which is, I would say, maybe a play for the next 10, 20 years, but that's something where probably we'll come back to you uh, in due time to clarify what we mean by that and what we can expect out of it. Thanks, Gail. Paul? So on the life and savings side, well, clearly, yes, you're right, an agent can't carry on doing what they're doing today as much as anything else because uh, the channel is becoming expensive relative to the yield of the products that they are able to provide their customers with. Um, I don't think we should focus on the GA crediting rate because, of course, GA tends to protect a downside. It gives a guaranteed return, but there are opportunities for upside too. And what we know well is that somebody who is planning today for retirement has to save more than double someone who retired just 15 years ago. So we know there's a massive need for society to save more. We know society needs to, to protect itself more, particularly as the state withdraws more social benefits. It needs to invest more in long-term health health prevention. So we're going to have to look at how we help our agents become more productive, focusing on long-term investment, protection and health, um, and how we can enable our customers to deal not only face-to-face -face with someone who can advise them, hold their hand through that experience, but also remote channels and ultimately, of course, you know, direct uh, digital channels too. So I think the, the role of the agent going forward is, is quite an optimistic one. I, I think we have to help them become more productive, and we do that because actually we see an increasing need in society for the products and the services that we can offer. Um, yeah. Andrew? I just want to come back on this ta US tax rate question, because I think if I look at your US life results, uh, the tax rate w was 40 million euros on 945 million of profit. I mean, so a 4% tax rate is, is the major reason why um, access tax rate is so low this year. Um, how do we square that with being enthusiastic, or your 40% tax rate and being enthusiastic about um, uh, a US tax rate coming down and benefiting you? And, and I suppose more broadly, what would you guide us to as the underlying tax rate um, for the uh, for the group um, going forward? Okay. Uh, uh, the the uh, the question is is much more about the uh, uh, the, the tax one-offs that we have in the U.S. and on a periodic basis, you can see that over the last years we had roughly 150 million of tax one-offs, which are linked to the DRD, uh, which means that uh, uh, we, we there are some tax audits, and it's only after these tax audits that we release the reserves corresponding to this uh, to this uh, uh, um, uh, to this uh, DRD. Uh, uh, that's, that's it. I cannot. Uh, and and uh, in in the in the next years, we still have tax one-off in the U.S. But I'm not. I was not referring to it. I was referring to the to the. Uh, uh, I was referring to the tax rate, uh, uh, the usual tax rate in the U.S. And I mentioned also. Uh, 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 I mentioned also the DRD because, and that's the reason why I said we should take care of what will be the impact. So I believe that the net will be positive. We still have. We we can still expect that we will have some release of reserves in the future, corresponding to the DRD. Point number number one, and point number two, uh, uh, we believe that on an ongoing basis, the net should be positive if there is a change in the US. So the implication of that is in future years you'll pay less than 40 million of tax in the States? No, but uh, it's, we could pay less than 40 million of tax. If you have a, if you have a tax one-off uh, uh, on the past years, which is at 150 million, and if you have a recurrent, uh, uh, a recurrent uh, tax rate which is instead of 35, uh, 35, 40 percent, which could, could drop to the equivalent of 20, then we might have a few years 
with a negative coming from the, from the US. Yes, it could be, it could be, uh, we could imagine this possibility, but again, please, let's wait for this uh, reform to see exactly what will be the, uh, the impact. And uh, I mentioned the DRD because uh, 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 we, we should not consider <coughs> that uh, it will be a straight decrease of the tax rate, but there could be some collateral uh, effects, but I maintain that the net should be uh, uh, a positive for us. Nick? Nick Holmes at SOGGEN. Just, just a, a very quick one. The EOPA requirement to disclose the impacts of the long-term guarantee package. Just wondered if you could share with us your preliminary thoughts. I mean, is this going to be helpful? Is this going to be meaningful? Thank you. Gérald? Uh, no. Uh, uh, I, uh, taking your questions, no. But uh, I don't believe so. I don't believe so because the long-term guarantee package, you know, it's... Uh, uh, um, and, and you have a, a few information on the volatility adjuster and so on, but, but I don't believe, I don't believe, but you know, uh, uh, keep in mind that over the next years there will be some further thinking about uh, some evolution that could take place. You remember that there will be some slight change expected in 18, but mostly it will concern the uh, standard formula, so we shouldn't be we shouldn't be concerned, but next it will be 2020, and in 2020 we could imagine some further uh, uh, adjustment. Uh, uh, roughly speaking, what is really at stake is the uh, is the equivalent of the uh, of the volatility adjuster, because the volatility adjuster should correspond to a reality, uh, uh, and uh, and that's that. Yes, that's that's mostly it. So no, I, I don't believe that uh, we should. Uh, 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 give too much emphasis to this. There will be some thinking. We we cannot expect in a foreseeable future any significant any significant change. I think just adding to this, I, I would look broader uh, at what are the different geographies doing, because uh, what you saw a couple of years ago was clearly a tendency to harmonize the standards uh, across the globe, uh, certainly for the systemically relevant insurers. What you see now is a certain deviation by geography from it. And the question, what does it mean for the competitiveness of players being situated in a geography that is better or worse positioned versus the other? Bob. Uh, this year? If I look at the uh, AFR, uh, your AFR in the uh, life section, the actual existing business contribution from that was around 7% last year. Is that a ongoing number to use? And secondly, are your numbers on, EV, on your new business done on the basis of EEV or Solvency 2, the AFR? It's clearly on NBV, it's done on the basis of uh, EEV. And be, that would be yeah. materially and higher than under. Uh, 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 that's, our, that's the way we that's the way we communicate because we believe that it better corresponds to an economic reality, and that's maybe a point on which I want to insist. It's not we we, we you notice that that in, in this report we try to keep both. We try to keep the EV because I know for us it's important because that's also the way we analyze our own business. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, take the example of the US, for example, it's, uh, it's uh, on the EV, it's a real economic basis, whereas on the AFR, it's the equivalent. So we wanted to keep both. So you will tell us exactly how you find this first uh, uh, attempt uh, to combine both and to present both, but uh, it's important to see the differences. And going back to your question about the, uh, uh, Rob, about the, uh, 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 the, the, so you, uh, uh, about the, the way we calculate the NBV, uh, we believe that the NBV should be more calculated on, the, on, uh, on an EV type of approach rather than on the FR. But we have to live with the FR. The FR is the way we measure our, solve, our solvency, and it will stay like this. But that 7% or 6.5% new business, the contribution of that AFR, which last year was approximately 7% that year. Is that an ongoing figure? I mean, I just took that two point. 
I should whatever. no, but I, I should check. I'll, I'll come back to you on this uh, on this point because uh, if your question, your reference is the seven uh, is the contribution to FR of the uh, yeah. of the new business. No, no, the actual contribution unwind. So you actually said ah, the unwind. Or, uh, the life and saving side, you said, gave you existing contribution of around. It's a 2.9 billion. Is that a 2.9 billion? Of the yeah, I yeah. Don't know what last well, yeah, like. that's. Uh, look, uh, uh, the, there is a direct link, not an immediate, but there is a link between these 2.9 billion and the cash flows, and uh, 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 of course, I don't expect it to be fundamentally different. So there could be some fluctuation around it. But I believe that it should be normally a good guess. The reason I ask is, I, 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 we're getting such materially different numbers, I can't do anything with them. So one of your peers yesterday disclosed 10 and a half of it. And I don't have their papers, you know, I don't not, have their figures. We're putting figures. new business values based on solvency too from them, so we're getting no comparability at all. No, but again, and I go back to, I go back to the previous question about the SFCR, the SFCR would be an opportunity for you guys uh, to have uh, a more consistency or at least to understand how it's done. And I believe that as such, it's a good point. F for us as well, we, have, uh, we, we don't always understand what the others are doing. And uh, it would be interesting to have something which is much more measurable and uh, a more comparison between the different entities. I agree with you. Any further questions? <laughs> Do we have any questions from the webcast or not? No. Very good. Then we close the session here. Thank you very much for coming and certainly thank you very much for asking very interesting questions. We wish you a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>